Thank you, Victoria, for the introduction, and welcome all. So it, internet has become an integral part of our life. And what if I tell you everything you do online or everything we do online leaves a trail of data. That data is being collected and analyzed and sold by companies. Now, a lot of us would think this is too abstract or even benign or both. But in the next 15 minutes, I'll shed some light on these data practices, why we should be concerned, and what exactly can we do. So we all, I assume we all understand that we are not supposed to share our credit card numbers online, right? <laughs> but yet there are some people who get way excited when they receive their new credit cards. And they take a photograph and post it online. So next time if you want to go online shopping, I highly recommend you follow this Twitter account. You might just get a new credit card. Then it also so happens that because of we not being careful enough, uh, we go online and the whiteboard behind us actually has some username or password. For example, in these cases, right? Happens. And I can give you more examples, I can go on and on about it, but it's fun, but not for today. Rather, I'll show you that even if you are careful and you are not sharing these things explicitly online, what companies on the internet know about you? I would like you to imagine a scenario in physical world. If a stranger follows your every move, which Uban do you take, where do you live, follows you everywhere on the street, it could be you, your spouse, your partner, your kids. If the stra same stranger also monitors all your internet history and computer usage. If that stranger is actually tapping your calls or making a log who you call, when you call, and for how long. Or imagine, Everybody, everybody of us gets post at our home. What if the person delivering the post reads all of, your, all of your mails and then keeps a copy of it? And this stranger who has been following us around, keeping tabs on our internet history, actually starts to share that information with other people without your consent. Or even take photographs and publish them somewhere. Or just send you, hey, happy birthday, I saw you there at such and such time. How many of us over here think this is some sort of stalking, right? If in the physical world this is stalking, then what about the digital world? And how would you react? If you know somebody is stalking you, how would you react? Would you take some action, maybe like confront the, the person who is stalking you, or maybe change your behavior? Or in an extreme scenario, you might report it to the authorities, right? But I'll show you how relaxed we are when it comes to being stalking in the digital world. Following your every move. Now we all use smartphones, right? And smartphones by default are designed to track wherever you move. On top of it, you install apps, which also have the same permission to track you wherever you're moving. We might assume that whatever web pages we visit in our browser are not known to anybody else, but that's a myth. If you follow this chart, even if you do not have a Google account, or a Facebook account, or a Twitter account, or as a matter of fact, even if you do not have Google or Facebook open in your browser right now, they can learn potentially huge portion of the websites that you visit. You do not have to be a Facebook or a Google user for that. You do not have to paste that link in Facebook. Even if you open a new tab in your browser, visit a web page, Facebook has the ability to learn it. To the extent that Facebook can actually learn 27% of the web pages that you visit. Now think about the web pages you've visited and just pick up randomly 27% of the web page. Facebook would know about them. If you talk about Google, Google actually knows 60% of your web history already. This is without you explicitly sharing it with Google. Now in the real world, uh, if somebody is listening to my phone calls or keeping a record, I'll be really paranoid, right? But somehow the apps that we install have the same permission. They are gathering the same information and we somehow don't seem to care. Similarly, if the person delivering post at your house is reading your, e re reading your post, you will be paranoid, right? But somehow, all the email providers that we use online, they are doing the same thing. They are reading what emails are coming to you, and they are using the content of the email to recommend you better advertisements, right? What about sharing your personal information with others? How many of you have ever taken a quiz online, on Facebook or generally? Now, I'll sh th there is a company called Cambridge Analytica. I'll not discuss the details about this company. But basically, it said, uh, we will pay you $2 
if you take an online quiz. People said, good. But if you have to take that online quiz, you have to log in using your Facebook account. People gave consent. They said, fine, we can do that. Now, in lieu of that, Cambridge Analytica got access to the Facebook data those people had, which is fine because those people gave consent to Cambridge Analytica. But what Cambridge Analytica or Facebook never mentioned is, we also have access to your friends' data because that's how the permission model worked in Facebook. So now imagine, out of all the friends you have on Facebook, some random person, some one of your friends, decides to take an online quiz for $2. And because that person takes the quiz, your Facebook data is now being shared to a company you have never even heard about. And this is a true story. It's not a myth. How about taking your photographs? Uh, does anybody know what's there? Is this on the left side? OK. So this is actually a project that is being carried out at Berlin Bahnhof. So basically, they've placed cameras. And as you move at Berlin Bahnhof, they, face, uh, they use facial recognition to see who this person is. Right? Now we can say, OK, government needs to do that for security reasons, blah, 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 bullshit. And then let's take a commercial example. This is Facebook. Facebook, for a long time, ran a feature, upload a photograph on Facebook. Facebook, based on its facial recognition database, will auto tag the person in the photo, photo. And if you're one of the person, you will receive a notification like this. There is some Amanda Willis who some odd reason took a photograph and uploaded that photograph, who you're not even friend with, but has two mutual friends with you, has tagged a photo of you. Now first, that person takes a photograph of you. Second, thanks to Facebook, that person can also recognize who you are because of its facial algorithm, right? And hence comes, comes the question, if for all these same things, we are so paranoid in the digital world, why in the physical world, why in the digital world, we are so relaxed? I have some hypotheses. First, either we are not aware, that's possible. Second, we are aware, but we do not understand the implications. Third, we do not care. But before moving into all these three points, I would like to share with you why these companies really want to stalk you online. How many of us use Facebook here? Come on, come on. I know everybody uses it. <laughs> How many of us pay for Facebook? No one? Very nice. If most of us use Facebook and none of us pays for Facebook, can somebody answer this simple question, how does Facebook make money? Very nice. So everybody understands that Facebook makes money by advertisement, right? The business model of Facebook is advertisements. I'll even take it to a higher level. The business model of Facebook is sharing promoted content. And the way to share promoted content is by advertisement. So it might, would, might be a product. It might be a particular campaign. It might be a particular post that people want to advertise, right? Now, unlike traditional mechanisms of advertisement, which we see in the offline world, newspapers and television, in the online world, advertisement is highly targeted. For example, if I have to sell a bicycle, I would go to Facebook, that Facebook I want to advertise. I would say I want to advertise bicycle to people of such and such age range, of gender, maybe only male, who live in 20 miles of my store and have searched for bicycles online, right? Fair enough. Facebook will let me do that. But this gets even creepier. Facebook also provides you granular attributes per person, and I can even run targeted ads based on religion, ethnicity, and sexual preferences of a person. And this is, again, a true story. In US, Facebook allowed real estate companies to run advertisement to not only exclude people based on a certain religion or certain ethnicity. So imagine you want to advertise a house, and you can say, I do not want this advertisement to be shown to people in Munich from India. Right? That's, that's the power of Facebook. And it does not matter that I've put this information somewhere that my religion is XYZ, my ethnicity is XYZ, or my sexual preferences are someone, something else. This, all this information can be gathered by these trails of data that we, are, uh, that we are leaving online. For example, based on just solely your Facebook likes, with a reasonable accuracy, it can be predicted whether your parents are divorced or not. It can be predicted what your gender is. It can be predicted what your political views is, what your religion is. With only access to your phone call records and app usage, or the way you type 
on your desktop or your mobile phone, companies can actually predict your personality. And this attribute is used for targeted advertisement. Think about it for a second. Most of the services or the apps that we use on the web are free. And the only way they can earn money is advertisement. And in order to convert you, they have to target you with the right kind of ad that you would click. So when you visit a website or when you visit Facebook, Facebook will try and fetch the best ad for you. And in order to do that, it will take all the data you have and sell it. So you are actually not the consumer. You are actually not the customer. You are actually the product being sold online. I've given examples of Facebook and Google. So you might wonder, yeah, fine, Facebook and Google are evil. But that's not the case. I only shared examples of Facebook or Google because these are the companies that we interact with. There is an invisible billion dollar market which is only specializing in data collection and advertisement. The companies we never even hear about, the companies we will never directly interact with. But these companies are collecting your data 24 by 7, and in most of the cases, without consent. Now, how do they gather data? There are three primary ways. One, they want to gather as much activity as you do on your mobile phone and web browsing. There's a common term called third-party tracking, which these uh, data collectors use. Second, even if you stop doing everything online, they also want to know what you do offline. So they will go to partners like loyalty cards, survey forms, and feedbacks, and collect that, and buy that information. Once they have information from these two sources, then they will exchange information among themselves to see how big of a data set can we make according to, for a person. Once they gather all this information, they will start to create a detailed dossier about you online and keep it up to date. So for example, it would say that person XYZ, this is the sexual preference of that person, the number of children, purchases, religion, health interests, and all these things. So there are about 3,000 to about 30,000 attributes that each company has on each person. And then this data is available for advertisers or use cases that have never been mentioned in the public, uh, public profiles. How easy is it to buy data? Let's just try and answer this question. So there is this website, Exact Data, whose sole purpose to exist on the internet is to sell your information. That's the sole purpose, right? With merely five clicks, you go on that website, with merely five clicks, you'll be able to select that I want name, address, postal code of person of a certain religion, of person having two or more children, of person who has children aged between two to five. And that data is readily available. If you want bulk orders, you can call them and negotiate the price. The intention of the buyer is never checked. Now this data can be used for anything. This data could be used for spreading hate. This data could be used to target children, lure them into illicit activities, or brainwash them, right? So the intent of buyer is never known, and these websites do not care. Government surveillance, right? Now, there is a huge roar uh, that governments should build surveillance systems. I beg to disagree. Governments do not need to build their surveillance systems because the internet companies have already done for them. All they need to do is access, the data, access this data from these companies. It could be by force, it could be by subpoena, it could be by partnering, or in itself, using their platform. For example, governments could, could use Facebook or Google advertisement to target a certain sect of people, right? So what can we do? Let's come to the main meat. What should we do? First and foremost, we need to be aware and vigilant about our digital, pri digital privacy the same way we are vigilant, vigilant about our physical privacy, right? In order to learn more, I highly recommend you follow these sources. So these are website f.org, whotracks.me, Cracked Labs, which will tell you more about what you can do about your online privacy. Second, thanks to these regulations like GDPR and e-privacy, we have more rights about our online privacy. There are a lot of people who argue that I have nothing to hide, so I do not give a shit about privacy. But I beg to differ again. Privacy is not about something to hide. It is about your right. It is right, right to transparency, right to share what information do you want to share with which companies and keep it to yourself. And GDPR is the first step in that direction. Because of GDPR, you can actually question all these companies what data they have on you. You can question them, you have to delete my data. Or you can question them, how do you process this data? If these companies fail to comply, 
they have to face hefty penalties. So you can actually send a letter to Facebook and tell, ask Facebook, what data do you have about me, which is not shared by me on the platform, and you should get your data back. You can move and you can adopt to tools like, for example, let's say you want to curb uh, how online, how your website history is being shared with other companies. So you could use one of these extensions, for example, uBlock Origin, Privacy Badger, put it in your browser, and it will help you stop leaking information to Google or Facebook. If you want alternative to search engines like Google, you could use search engines like Quant, DuckDuckGo, Clicks, etc. As a matter of fact, if you really want the browser to protect your, protect your online privacy by default, you could again opt into browsers like Brave, Tor, Firefox, Clicks. So there are multiple options. You can, we'll have these slides online so you can take a look. So depending on which layer do you want to protect, you can, you can do that. In the end, I would just like to say all hope is not lost. Thanks to the scandals of Facebook, Cambridge Analytica, a much needed discussion on your online privacy is happening. Thanks to GDPR, we have much more control on the companies that were unregulated before. And thanks to the companies I showed you in the previous slide who are building better products and preserving our privacy online. Thank you. Thank you very much, Konark. By the way, we just published a post on our Facebook page with the resources that Konark suggested to us that you can have a look and find out more. And now we're ready to take some questions. So, yes, please. So you said uh, in one of the near the end of your presentation that uh, you can contact uh, contact the company and uh, request that your information be deleted. How can you actually confirm though that they've deleted your information and they haven't already sold it to ten thousand different companies? Mm -hmm. yeah. The question is how to get to be, make sure that the company actually deletes your information if you ask to, to for for this and how to know that it, w it wasn't sold yet to many other companies already? So it's a valid question. So first of all, every website or every invisible website uh, needs to list on their website uh, something called data protection officer. So they have to give an email address or a physical address where you can contact that person, right? Now once you have that address, now the question is how do we ensure that the data is actually deleted, right? It's, it's hard, but if you request them, that you have to delete the data and they do not delete it, you can, they can be audited. And once they are audited and it is found that the data is actually not deleted, even on request, they can be fined for it. Second, they also have to tell, you have to, they have to take your consent. So I don't know how many people remember, but probably in the last few weeks you would have seen spam of emails coming up, hey, we miss you, our privacy policy, and blah, 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 blah. They were not being good to you, right? It was because of GDPR law that they had to really ask for your consent, right? So once you even ask them to delete it, if they want to collect more information about you, they will have to take another consent from it. And this all happens if they get audited and they get caught, which is more likely to happen because then you can complain that, hey, I requested my data to be deleted, but it's not deleted. So what, what's happening there? Second, the second point, like if the company has already shared that information, for example, Facebook has already shared that information with Cambridge Analytica. Now this, this is like the tricky, tricky part because first, now onwards, companies need to declare that your data is being shared with these parties, and companies need to create a process to help you delete that information across. So it's not like if one website says, I share your data with 10 websites, so you as a customer need to go to those 10, 10 websites. That's why now if you visit a website, they will open a pop-up which has a lot of buttons for each of these, each of these third parties. So it's tricky, and it, these are still very early days for companies who are complying with GDPR, so let's see. But I'm still hopeful that uh, there will be processes which will help you, help you do that. Thank you, Connor. Let's have one more question. Yes, please. Yeah, you. Hmm? Uh, hey, uh, great talk, by the way. Thank you. Um, yeah, I have a question. Being uh, such a digital privacy whiz, <coughs> I was wondering if uh, what's your pri uh, what's your personal approach towards all this stuff? Like, do you still use Facebook, but uh, using some kind of certain tricks, like you know, VPN, fake accounts, stuff like this, or do you completely resign because it's for for you morally <laughs> not acceptable to use it? Or what about WhatsApp and, and services like that? Yeah. So how are you actually, Conor, approaching this question? Do you resign from Facebook and other things, or you just use fake accounts, or what's your approach? So easier one first, I don't use WhatsApp. Uh, me and my complete family uses something called Signal, uh, so that's one way. Second, yes, uh, I am still on Facebook. 
but uh, I use Facebook in a very in a totally different browser that I do not use for visiting any other website. Uh, there is something called in one of the resources I've also mentioned something called Data Detox, which is basically it's an eight-day model that you can follow, which will help you um, which will help you reduce your network footprint. Right. So for example, on Facebook. Uh, I manually review all the privacy settings that I have. Uh, I do not want targeted advertisements, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so there are multiple steps depending on uh, what threat model do you think is the best for you or for your family. Like a lot of people in my family are not on Facebook anymore. Uh, I am there. I could say I like to keep my enemies closer, whatever. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so it depends what you want to do. But uh, there are alternatives which respect your privacy for basically all the things that we use. And in today's world, uh, you do not have to really choose between convenience and privacy because there are companies who are building products which will get you convenience and privacy. So you should opt for those products. Thank you, Conor. I suggest the next questions we we'll take to the break, discuss over beer. I see there are more questions, so please approach Conor. And now let's thank him for a great talk.